Hello, uh, welcome to Foreign Entanglements. I'm Matt Duss. I'm with the Center for American Progress. Joining me today is Hussein Ibish, a senior research fellow at the American Task Force on Palestine and widely published author, debater, speaker, etc., etc. Hussein, thanks for joining me today. Good to be with you, Matt. Thank you. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is the Egyptian presidential election. Um, I think there was a poll out. I just saw a poll this morning from the BBC. There's which, a new one every day. A new one every day, um, and it things some things change, some things stays the same. I think um, uh, Amr Musa was up. Now he's in second. Um, right. Did you see this poll, and wh what is your take on the current situation? Yeah, I, I, I saw the, I saw the poll. There's at least one or two every day. Um, any individual poll on any issue in any country, and I think particularly this is the case in, in societies such as those in the Arab world like Egypt where um, political openness, political honesty, and, and um, polling are, are, are new phenomena. I mean, they just had mm -hmm. the first ever right. presidential debate on TV. Um, need, each individual poll has to be taken with a grain of salt. But when you see trends over time that are consistent, uh, it tells you something. Uh, and the most important trend in, in Egypt is how poorly the Muslim Brotherhood candidate uh, Morsi is doing. It's, it's, mm. it's in sharp contrast to their um, almost sort of um, unchallenged and effortless victory uh, in, in the parliamentary elections. It's, it's, right. it, it seems almost inconceivable that there won't be a runoff, but it also seems almost inconceivable that Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood candidate, the Freedom and Justice Party, will be part of that. Um, the, the other trend that's hard to miss is a, sur a really unexpected surge uh, by uh, Shafiq, the, the former mm -hmm. Prime Minister, um, right. who's very closely associated with uh, the former regime, and some people think the military. And, um, he, you know, he, he really didn't seem to be an appealing or plausible candidate compared to uh, an establishment figure with huge name recognition and, and a, a deep history of involvement with Egyptian uh, international relations, and therefore he can claim, you know, kind of national pride, Amr Musa, versus this rather charismatic, breakaway, liberal Islamist, if there is such a thing, or, or relatively liberal Islamist, uh, Abu Fatuh. And, and um, you know the the idea that this former prime minister of, of of a very discredited era, associated with all kinds of um, uh, questionable um, institutions and histories, could could do a sudden surge and and mm -hmm. be a plausible candidate is surprising. Um, but I think all the trends suggest that it will be uh, a runoff that no one will get a, an outright majority, and it'll be a runoff. And, and it really looks like Amr Musa versus Abu Fatuh, and, which sets up a very interesting uh, dilemma for Egyptians because <clears throat> Amr Musa is a known quantity, and um, he's, uh, whatever people may think of him, he's um, associated with um, uh, Egypt's foreign policy, with Egypt, Egypt's national mm -hmm. identity, Amor Propra, etc. Uh, and although he would represent a continuation of the past, at the same time, he uh, can plausibly um, present himself, and he has been, as a reliable figure, someone with vast name recognition, and someone that, that uh, could put, you know, sort of be a consensus candidate. Right, that's what's, acceptable. It, it, so what's interesting about Amr Musa is that he <coughs> seems to have, you know, for someone who is so deeply, deeply involved um, with, the, with the former regime, he, yeah. you know, over the past year, he seems to have very, very, sh you know, shrewdly and skillfully kind of distance himself from that just enough. Usually, yeah, yeah, I, I think that's right. I've, I've called him the Kissinger of Egypt, uh, <laughs> in the sense that, in the sense that he kind of, um, you know, does a similar line that, well, I was off dealing with, you know, right. the big picture national but it's also, he, he I wasn't seemed, involved in that stuff. So. He does seem to he offer also, to Egyptians things mm -hmm. about the previous... Uh, you know, it's things about Egypt, nationalism, kind of a continuity yeah. that no. they do like. Uh, absolutely, and uh, he's he has been shrewd. He's he was he was he he saw I think the populist direction right. earlier than most of the rest of the Mubarak yes. regime. I think he was he was saying publicly what 
the people wanted to hear about you know their their uh, prerogatives and, mm -hmm. and their right to to decide things very right. early on I think he has made a few missteps but not many he's been more damaged by the missteps of some people around him or other people associated with the former regime uh, but he does still carry that burden of, of being a, a, a kind of a return uh, to the past or a continuation of the past that's, that's appealing in some ways and uh, on the other hand if you really want change it's not so appealing Abdul Futuh is a very interesting candidate he's very charismatic mm -hmm. uh, and he's a bit of an enigma in the sense that uh, he was part of the Muslim Brotherhood very much for a long time but he broke with them and he, he's had terrible relations with their spiritual guide for mm -hmm. over a decade mm -hmm. and I think they were looking for an excuse to get rid of him and he yeah. himself has emphasized you know I quit the party and I'm not part of the Muslim Brotherhood anymore and I'm really a liberal but mm -hmm. I think I anyone with any uh, critical sense in Egypt has to wonder how far this guy really has has gone uh, from his Islamist roots and um, you know while he's definitely not friendly with the Muslim Brotherhood leadership or inst Muslim Brotherhood as an institution do they really want to deliver um, the both the parliament and the presidency to Islamists even if they're not exactly the same Islamists right. and even if they may, may say, see things differently and now be rivals but that's mm -hmm. a really open question Egypt Egypt is an old society. I, I don't mean the pyramids. I mean modern Egypt is, yeah. is, is, is an old society with old institutions, not like most of the rest of the Arab world or lots of the rest of the Arab world are kind of baby states or fledgling mm -hmm. states or states that never really congealed. Egypt has lots of very old institutions, hundred modern institutions that are hundreds of years old, and then uh, more traditional institutions that are thousands of years old or, or in, into the more than thousand years old. This is an old society. Mm -hmm. And it, Egy Egyptians have a long history of balancing. And it's almost in the way the Americans uh, balance between mm -hmm. different forces. So I wouldn't be at all surprised if Egyptians who went and voted for the Muslim Brothers uh, for Parliament had absolutely no intention of voting for the Muslim Brothers for the presidency right. precisely because they don't want any single force right. to have primacy in the way that Americans love to have a president uh, of one party in the White House and a House of Representatives in the hands of the other party. We, <laughs> we love that. We keep doing it and occasionally we'll be so mad at one party or another that we just hand them the whole kit and caboodle that yeah. happened to the Democrats um, three and a half years ago mm -hmm. but that is usually subject to a quick correction and that wasn't yeah. uh, or, or quick you know uh, sort of uh, yeah right. no correction is, is right. the word um, and and I think e Egyptians might actually want some balance so then the question is between um, Amr Musa and Abdul Futur, it's going to be, I think, a difficult choice. And the other thing in the polls that's very clear is that the big majority of Egyptians haven't decided. Mm -hmm. It's at least 40%. That's the minimum you get of 38 40% in all the polls is undecided. Now, that's a very big number. And that can swing. It's, I do not think that offers hope for uh, Mr. Morsi of the Muslim Brotherhood to, to make it into the uh, second round. I, I see the surge uh, of the former prime minister, but I would be surprised. I really do think it's going to end up as a runoff mm -hmm. between uh, Musa and Abu Fatuh, and um, and then we'll see uh, a very complex situation emerging. Let's then, stay on. of course, the the crucial thing to understand, by the way, is that Egypt still has a presidential system. The the Muslim Brothers and and the Salafists between them got about seventy percent of the seats in the parliament. But it, it really needs to be understood by our viewers and by uh, Americans that that parliament has almost no power at the moment mm -hmm. under Egyptian law. Mm -hmm. The power is concentrated in the presidency, uh, which is held by the military. But after the second round of the election, it will be handed over to uh, whoever wins the presidency, and that will kick off the most intensive part of the negotiation over the separation of powers, the new social contract in Egypt, which is um, going to be a very difficult balancing act between four forces, three established and one largely unorganized. The, the, there's the military, there's the remnants of the former regime, particularly the Ministry of the Interior and the secret police of the Mubarak era, which still exists, and the Muslim Brothers. Uh, those are the three established entities and then and then there are the street protesters um, and the sort of um, 
liberals uh, on the street who uh, are not really very organized politically but can come out in a crisis in a very decisive way mm -hmm. <coughs> or sometimes in a quixotic way as we've seen um, and so th th these forces I think are going to have to negotiate a, uh, a, a, a separation of powers and a balance of powers between them th through the different institutions that they hold um, in a complex way, and you can imagine a sensible power-sharing agreement in which domestic matters are handled by uh, Parliament, which puts a pres uh, prime minister in charge, and as sort of a French system with, with divided authority between a, uh, mm -hmm. a Parliament that's largely domestic and a, a president that's largely national security, foreign policy, with the army either de facto or de jure still having final say on defense and uh, national security mm -hmm. issues in terms of actual wars and how to enforce border control and things like that. That is the optimistic scenario. Uh, but um, <clears throat> it's going to be rough because uh, um, uh, everything's up for grabs. And I do, th I think that, that um, one thing I'd like to emphasize is that a lot of us thought for quite a while that the Muslim brothers had peaked too early. Uh, the way they won so decisively um, in the, pres in the, pre in the uh, parliamentary elections was maybe not the best thing for them in the long run. And that uh, it's also downhill from here. That, that mm -hmm. they, they, maybe they plateaued. Maybe they'll keep, you know, the sort of 40% uh, ratio that, that they have or 35% or something. But there is a danger always of a backlash when you win so big, even from people mm -hmm. who voted for you. Um, maybe they want uh, Muslim brothers to have a, uh, a role in the government but not hand the whole thing over to them. And, and in a, a presidential system, it's going, to, it's going to be difficult for the parliament to wrest powers away from the presidency. So uh, I think that's why uh, there, was a de there, there has been an increasing degree of palpable desperation on the part of the Muslim brothers about how much power they're going to be able to get for the parliament, which made them break their solemn promise that they would not run anybody for president, and how badly their presidential candidate is doing in the polls and mm -hmm. apparently uh, has little hope of making the runoff. And the, all of this is a total shock to them. They, they're yeah. still trying to figure out what happened. Well, let's, I'm, uh, not, let's, I'm not surprised, but they are. Let's let's go back and just stay on Abu al Fatuh for a minute. Um, yeah. Someone who's interestingly garnered a lot of support both from Salafis and from <coughs> Egyptian liberals. Um, <coughs> Pretty, right. you know, it, as all politicians do, ha seems able to present himself as many things to many people. Absolutely. Um, but has said, you know, a number of fairly progressive, you know, relatively progressive things. I'm thinking specifically uh, about, you know, yeah. leaving the Islamic faith and converting to Christianity right. or what have you. I mean, this is something mm -hmm. that we've also seen from um, Tunisia yeah. and Rashid Ganucci and the Nada party. Yeah, he, he's, you know, he yeah, has I, said I think that's a, a good comparison. Yeah, I, I think I think Abdul Fattah is more or less where Nahda is, which puts him considerably less to the right or more more to the center than most of the Arab Islamists and the Muslim mm -hmm. brothers but it still means that he represents the religious right I mean mm -hmm. let's not let's not right. kid ourselves about this guy is not he's a very clear he's a, I mean he has he has very yeah. clear you know he has this you know his, his thing is basically like listen we don't need to enforce Sharia Egyptians are just naturally right. Muslim or pro-Islam right. You know, he's right. making a, a similar argument to just the Christian, you know, America is a Christian nation. Yeah, argument completely. That we've seen no, from, no, that's, um, you know, that's American, right. you know, uh, conservative Christians. Right. No, I, th I think that's right. And, and um, the other thing is about him is that while he's definitely on the left wing of the Islamist perspective, that's the left of the right. Right. That's, that's, you know, and let's, uh, let's be clear about that. He's, he's not a liberal, and anyone who thinks he is is wrong. However, he, he, I think he can appeal to liberals in this election because he is not associated with the Muslim Brotherhood leadership anymore, and they don't mm -hmm. like each other. It's yeah. personal. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, it really, it's not even about ideas. They, they have people at least as liberal as him inside the Muslim Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. they, they don't usually throw people out for, for what they say. They throw people out for breaking party discipline. He broke mm -hmm. party discipline when they said, we will not run a presidential candidate, he said, I'm running anyway. They said, right, you're out, which is something they probably wanted to do for quite a while, but mm -hmm. really couldn't under their structures. 
Um, and now they look like total hypocrites uh, in many ways because mm -hmm. they threw him out for running for president, then they ran somebody for president. So, right. uh, he, but it, he can appeal to liberals and uh, non-Islamists in the sense that, uh, on the one hand, as I say, he's not close to the Muslim Brotherhood leadership, even though he's some kind of an Islamist. At the same time, um, he's not tainted with any association with the former regime. In other words, if you want change, Qua change. If you're really looking to move on and put the past behind, he he represents a very appealing alternative uh, because Amr Musa does represent continuity, and so does Shafiq, so does the former prime minister. But both of these guys represent sort of aspects of the past. Now that also has an appeal, mm -hmm. but um, but I think I think it's possible for Abul Futuh to uh, tap into two constituencies that theoretically he shouldn't be able to. One is uh, liberals who were involved in the protests who would prefer him uh, to the Muslim brothers because they don't like the Muslim brothers and who would prefer him to Amr Musa because they would see Amr Musa as exactly a representative, mm -hmm. maybe not the worst, maybe one of the better, but still a representative of, of everything it is they wanted to bring down. And mm -hmm. this guy at least is new and different and he's not a fire-breathing Islamist. He's right. a soothing sort of an Islamist. He's sort of, he's not, he's, he's more, more Joel Olstein than Jerry Falwell, if you <laughs> If you follow me, but right, but he's exactly. no, but he's still on the all right. The other group that he can tap into that he shouldn't be able to, but is is the Muslim Brotherhood youth. Yeah. Uh, I think the Muslim Brotherhood youth is is making it very clear um, that it's it's it, a lot of them are going to break ranks over this, and they're not going to vote for Morsi. They're going to vote for Abdul Futur because they like him better, and they too have issues with the uh, senior leadership, and they too are annoyed with the autocratic. And they've, they're sympathetic to the manner and way in which he left the party, and I think there is a group of them who think that he is more where they want to be in the Ghanoushi kind of space than in the uh, Morsi space. Morsi, by the way, has been tacking quite severely to the right over the past couple of weeks, and uh, that's I, I don't think that's helping him either. I mean, he's been making a... Uh, 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 comments that seem to condone female genital mutilation. He's been mm -hmm. talking much more um, uh, pointedly about sh Sharia and the importance of not Sharia as an inspiration, but the source and the only source, mm -hmm. maybe. I mean, all this kind of like very, it's, it's, it's almost charging backwards in terms of Islamist rhetoric. It's kind of stuff you would have expected from a Muslim Brotherhood party that was excluded entirely from the political process and wanted to go deep base, you know, rather mm -hmm. than reach out beyond its constituents. And, and there are so many signs of desperation in his camp and in his party over, over this issue and over the fact that they haven't gotten very far in negotiating great, a, a more parliamentary system. Now, after the presidential election, they'll have another opportunity to go back to it. They do have uh, a position of relative strength given their parliamentary victory, but if they go down badly in the presidential election, there'll be a lot more balance in the negotiation, and um, I, I think it, the, the, the power-sharing agreement I described, I still think is on the table, and I, I can't think of another one that produces long-term stability, at least over the next few years in mm -hmm. Egypt. Otherwise, I think you're just going to keep having, um, you know, a, a, a kind of very bitter a competition between the four power elements that I um, outlined. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving before you know, moving over to uh, the the politics of is of Egypt's neighbor Israel. Um, we saw last week uh, a surprise announcement uh, that shocked a lot of people of uh, the creation of a new coalition government, the largest coalition in Israel's history. Uh, with uh, actually, I don't know anyone who wasn't shocked. Um, Kadima leader Shal Mufaz brought into Bibi's new coalition um, with the, the the title of I think vice prime minister deputy is that right? deputy no deputy prime minister deputy prime and minister, minister without so portfolio Min yes, and minister right. without portfolio and and let let's be, let me be clear about what that means it means specifically that there is a three person kitchen cabinet of mm -hmm. Netanyahu. Mm -hmm. uh, Mofaz and Defense Minister Barak and an, and an, uh, a eight person inner cabinet right. in which right. Mofaz will be a member, 
and there'll be no other Kadima member. So this is yeah. not a deal between two parties. It's a deal between two guys. And right. you can see why what they got out of it. It's not that too much. Right. And so we, you know, since over the past week, you know, everyone and, and, and their brother has been offering, you know, their theories about what this means, whether this has anything to do with Iran, whether it has everything to do with Iran, whether it has mostly to do, you know, with the, the, the role of the Orthodox in Israeli society, right. uh, whether it's the coalition mostly with the secularists, yeah. the, the economic issues that Israel Israel, you know, was dealing with an, in the protests last year, the J14 protests, yeah. which, which look ready to get started again this summer. That, um, I think no or, doubt. Or is it all of those? So what, what's your take? Uh, or none. Uh, no, I, I think, I, I don't know, um, yeah. to tell you the truth. I mean, if, uh, to, to be, you know, clear and factual and accurate, the truth is I don't know. And, and I think that the deeper truth is only two people know, plus their closest, closest right. aides. And that's Mofaz, the individual, and Netanyahu, the individual. Mm -hmm. I don't think most people in Likud and Kadima know. I don't mm -hmm. think most people in the group of eight know. And I don't know if even Barak, probably he's not privy to the details of this thing. I can see what both, part, what both parties got out of it. I can see why Mofaz might have approached Netanyahu, which is probably the trajectory of this, yeah. uh, saying, listen, I'm not really that interested in an election that's going to bring my party from 27 seats right. in the Knesset to 11 or 10. Um, I can give you 16 months of uninterrupted power. Uh, what will you give me? Uh, and back and forth. We don't know what they agreed. Maybe they didn't agree on anything. Maybe that was enough for both of right. them. And and I th I I'm, I don't know if this has if they have an understanding on Iran, or on the Palestinians, or on the Tal law. That is to say, the the, the exemptions for uh, the religious, um, you know, kind of extreme privileges given to the religious that most mm -hmm. Israelis are getting really really fed up with on the social protests that I agree will resume as the weather warms mm -hmm. uh, and, and um, or uh, on uh, uh, any of these other issues I, it, it, I think it's entirely possible that this is actually a deal between two politicians for their own political purposes and, and I think it's possible that they may do some tinkering with some things, um, you know, th there may be a culture war element with the ultra-Orthodox, where right. they, they don't strip them of all their privileges, they leave loopholes and things, but they, they might do a, a, a decisive culture war victory for the secularists, because that, that's a big majority of Israelis, and, and yeah. that'll, you know, that'll be relatively painless, especially if they leave loopholes, mm -hmm. uh, so that, the th the, so that it's, it's, if it's more symbolic than, uh, than practical uh, elimination of those privileges, if it's more a slap on the hand than a punch in the face, mm -hmm. uh, then I think I think that's something they, they can all agree on, um, uh, except Shas. And if it's symbolic, Shas maybe that could go out of the coalition without damaging it, or they can live with it and, and take more. Maybe they take money in some other way. I, I don't know. Um, I, I, honestly, um, I, I think... Anyone who speculates about um, the intentions behind this coalition is is doing so. Everyone I know, anyway, um, is doing so without uh, proper information. Without mm -hmm. and and I and I don't I don't much like that. I think vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Palestinians, the uh, fact that the new government is going forward with the uh, attempt to retroactively. Um, recognize um, illegal settlement outposts. Illegal, right. I say, under Israeli law. They're all yeah. illegal under international law, right. but illegal even by Israel's own standards. And right. and in defiance of Supreme Court orders, augurs ill. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, the the last, the outgoing coalition was uh, on a kind of a rampage of settlement activity, retroactively recognizing outposts, right. uh, setting up new uh, settlements, I and mean, drop, uh, dropping the pretense. I, that yeah. is a better way of putting it. Dropping the pretense that they weren't building new settlements. Right. And doing so shamelessly uh, and aggressively. And um, it so far, it doesn't look like this new coalition, very early days yet, but it doesn't look like they're going to have a, a particularly different approach because... They s they're going forward with this Ulpana uh, thing, which the Supreme mm -hmm. Court said you have to you have to evacuate and demolish by July 1st because it was built on privately owned Palestinian land, uh, and um, this uh, current government apparently is uh, considering strongly and uh, may even try to pass a bill 
that would um, bypass the Supreme Court yeah. order and and uh, make this illegal thing legal under right. Israeli law, illegal right. totally in the eyes of the rest right. of the world. Right. Uh, so I'm not, um, I don't know what the terms of the deal were, but we haven't seen any symptoms of it yet, particularly regarding the Palestinians, and it may just be um, a marriage of convenience, a yeah. very, very shallow one at that. Right. I mean, worth noting that, uh, you know, up to, you know, days uh, before the deal was announced, Moltaz was mm. criticizing Bibi in the strongest <laughs> terms. Uh, well, he called him a liar. He would, saying, he calling him a liar, saying he would never join a government with Bibi, yeah. criticizing him on Iran, on everything, on settlements, and then, mm -hmm. all, lo and behold... Um, so, <laughs> well, yeah, what so was I mean, particularly hilarious was that uh, after the uh, signing-in ceremony for the new coalition, uh, reporters asked Mufaz about those comments, as particularly his comment only a couple of days before that Netanyahu was a liar, which mm -hmm. is a very blunt thing to say mm -hmm. uh, by any politician against another. And his reaction was, well, let's not dwell on the past. <laughs> which I thought, I thought was fantastic. Let's not um, bicker and argue I, I have who to say, killed who. Exactly, we have we, ha we have a knight from the round table here. Of course, it's very it was very Python esque. It was straight out of the Holy Grail, uh, completely. And and he also, by the way, for for a uh, a Lebanese American, looked looked exceptionally Lebanese. Yes, uh, I have <laughs> to say, really Israeli funny. politics. Israeli <laughs> politics, it looks a lot like Lebanese politics in many ways, with the difference that Israel is much more of a real country mm -hmm. uh, in, in institutional terms, and Lebanon is much more of a, of a, of a fractured, fragmented, mm -hmm. quasi-state. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but, the, but the ease with which Israeli politicians slither around the political spectrum and switch sides and, and make coalitions there is... is it, 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 it has a very Lebanese feel to it, and it doesn't mm. look a lot like... I mean, sure, the British coalition uh, between um, the Tories and the Liberal Democrats is, is a strange one, uh, but it's not nearly as convoluted and strange mm -hmm. as this. It looks positively Lebanese. Yeah. Um, so, in regard to the, 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 the legalizing of, of settlements um, and, you know, what seems to mm. be... You know, we have from various people, whether it's um, uh, Moshe Yalan, uh, Yuval Diskin, uh, you know, <laughs> Boogie Yalan, his nickname Boogie, but um, um, said he, he was quoted in um, a speech to um, a group last year saying that mm -hmm. the goal of this government is to just completely turn away from the two-state solution. Um, he was yeah. saying that supportively. Um, mm -hmm. We had, you know, Bibi's own father who recently passed away. Um, yeah. You know, who said similar things as, as you know, as a way of like calming down people who might think that Bibi was serious about two states. And then right. we had we right. had um, um, the former intelligence chief Yuval Diskin just a few weeks ago saying almost the exact same thing in, in it from a critical standpoint, saying this government is yeah. not interested. So I mean, what I'm getting at is that I, I was really interested yesterday in reading a piece by Caroline Glick, who's you know really kind of out there, but unfortunately does yeah, speak sure for a, a a a constituency in Israel. And she was referring to this, um, an op-ed by you know, American Congressman Joe Walsh, in which he said, you know, Israel just needs to annex the entire West Bank. Let's forget about mm -hmm. this Palestinian state thing, annex the West Bank, um, and give the Palestinians limited voting rights. Now, right, you know, I think right. it was, that's nuts on a number of levels, not least, because I don't think you've ever seen an American congressman making an argument explicitly for second-class citizenship before, as Walsh was doing. But but Glick agreed with that. Not for not for a while. It's been <laughs> not a while. for a while. Yes, it's in our past. Sure, and um, it's in our past in a couple of ways, both in terms of segregation and and there were people who supported apartheid South Africa. Right. Okay. They, they didn't fair, support fair the point. principle of it, but they but they said no, these are good guys, and on our side, right. these the Russians right. and whatnot. So, um, but it's been a while. That's that's all pre Cold War end of Cold War. But Glick basically, you know, applauding Walsh. And sure. saying, yes, yeah. let's forget all this. These peace processors mm -hmm. are completely deluded. Though, right. you know, I guess I guess to, to her credit, she was like, No, let's 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 just annex the West Bank and give full voting rights to the Palestinians. Which, you know, gets to what you know, something that's been kind of bugging me for a while is that it seems given everything that's going on, all the trends, we have mm -hmm. for the time being the two state solution that we're mm -hmm. gonna get, which is an Islamist Gaza and Israel and 
Israel, including the West Bank, though, of course, with, with three million Palestinians with, well, with, you know, with second-class status. Um, uh, well, look, uh, first of all, let me say uh, that I dealt with these fantasies in my last column mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. for the Daily Beast, and mm -hmm. I specifically mentioned Walsh and Glick, but also a, a lot of other um, proposals yeah. uh, on the Israeli right for a greater Israel with some kind of accommodation of Palestinians that falls short of equal rights, equal citizenship, and certainly not mm -hmm. equal voting rights. And some right. confederation where an Isra a Palestinian entity would elect its own leaders, but but clearly Israeli primacy is you mm -hmm. know behind all of this. These are these are all um, versions of the fantasy of a greater Israel that incorporates the Palestinian territories without giving equal rights to the Palestinian population. Okay, and that, that, and and most of them forget about the Gaza Strip. And and I I, I have to say, first of all, I I don't accept the proposition that uh, there are three states or three entities or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Neither Hamas nor the PA accepts uh, that any any um, formal division between uh, Gaza and the West Bank. And I don't think Gaza has a future outside of uh, the rest of Palestine. And mm -hmm. I don't think Gaza's Hamas leadership, which is now the more among the most extreme wing of Hamas because of complex circumstances, they don't make that claim either. Mm -hmm. And um, I just point out that the public sector employees in Gaza are almost entirely paid for by their salaries are paid right. by who? By the, by the PA in Ramallah. Right. So the, the and 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 um, the Palestinians have been loath to go forward with uh, elections, uh, national elections of any kind, w without the participation of Hamas in Gaza. And Hamas, because its its popularity has been sort of uh, plummeting over recent yeah. um, years, is is even less keen on elections than Fatah, which isn't particularly yeah. keen on them either. Um, Fatah is going to go ahead. Apart, they keep saying, I'll, I'll, I'll believe it when we see it, but they're again saying they're going to go ahead with municipal elections in the West Bank without mm -hmm. the cooperation of Gaza, uh, of Hamas in Gaza. But uh, I don't. I don't think that there's a Palestinian constituency, even in Hamas, for a formalized break with the other Palestinians. Right. And 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 so I disagree with that um, analysis. We have we have a, a circumstance in which the Palestinians are politically divided. That's right. for sure. And and that has a geographical dimension. Right. And over time, it is not impossible uh, that uh, this could take on a different character. But at the moment. It's it's a political split, and and the reason there's a geographical division is Palestinians don't have a state apparatus. Right. This is all a symptom of the occupation, and Gaza is as much under occupation as the West Bank is. Right. Before it, before we go settlers. forward, I think that's an important yeah. point. I'd like to stay on yeah. that. But before we continue, yeah. I just want to bring in this piece by Jonathan Spire that was um, mm -hmm. referenced uh, by Jeff Goldberg in, in his, on his blog yesterday. Um, and interestingly, yes. Jeffrey Goldberg just wondered about what Hussein Ibish would have to say about this. Um, so I just yeah. I thought it would be a great opportunity for, for you to have your say on that. But just to kind of set up okay. Spire's piece, he was saying that, you know, the, the takeover of Gaza by, by Hamas is, is kind of, it's not well understood how much this has completely changed the, the two state paradigm, how much damage it's done to it, and how it's created an, an entirely new situation, and with implications that we haven't, that those, you know, people who followed the two-state process for so long haven't quite fully begun to grasp. What did you think of that? Uh, I think it's, I think it's a specific diagnosis of, uh, or it's description of, of the reality um, of Hamas rule in Gaza is, is largely accurate. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think that it misses a couple of key points. First, it, uh, it ascribes a diplomatic significance to that s powerful control by Hamas in Gaza that it doesn't have. The only representative, the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people, diplomatically, internationally, and, and in terms of negotiating anything with anybody at a national level, is the PLO. And that there is no document 
no Palestinian document, no Arab document, no international document, no Israeli-Palestinian document, no document that exists that says that, would, that has any, any validity that, that says anything different. And as a matter of fact, Hamas acknowledges this. Hamas does, time and again, has said the, the PLO is the entity that uh, is entrusted with negotiating with Israel, that is, in mm -hmm. fact, our diplomatic represent. They don't claim to be... Now, they do say the PLO should be restructured, by which mm -hmm. they mean they should take it over uh, and whatnot, but they, they won't... The, this, the international standing of the PLO is one of the most important achievements of the Palestinian national movement. It's mm -hmm. one of the few, actually, mm -hmm. and, and it's very valuable. Mm -hmm. And uh, so both because Hamas knows, I think, in his heart of hearts, it's not ready for prime time, Diplomatically, um, you know, the, and because they understand that, un, you know, it, it would be incredibly dangerous to challenge the authority of the PLO as recognized under international mm -hmm. law, and you would lose a lot for the Palestinian cause if you did that. In fact, you'd lose the whole structure of Palestinian diplomatic status in the world, which is much less than zero. It's not, you know, a, a state, but it, diplomatically, it's it's fairly far advanced um, in terms of recognition of presence in multilateral institutions and whatnot. That's all based on the legal status of the PLO. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the first thing that, that needs to be recognized. The second thing that needs to be recognized is that um, this, is, this is a function of the occupation. And, if, and uh, Hamas's control in Gaza is, is done practically through force. But it's also, you know, insofar as it has a constituency, and it's not very popular right now, but that, that, that's not the point. The point is that insofar as it has a constituency, it's um, based on despair about uh, the two-state solution and about negotiation. So, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, anyone who decries this situation should understand that the Israelis have played a very big role in getting Hamas to where they are, uh, they encouraged the formation of Hamas, and I think many Israeli policies over the years, especially on the part of the Israeli right and the settler movement and uh, the, the more extreme Israelis, have, have dovetailed perfectly with the interests no, of Hamas. No, I, th I think that's no, right. I, I mean, this is, this is why... No, go ahead. I'm sorry, finish? Go ahead and finish. No, no, you first. I have more to say about Spire, but you go ahead first. Right, I just want to address some other points. Like he, does, he does get at the, you know, the, the growing prominence of the internal... Gaza leadership versus the external leadership, um, but, w but he what you were, and I think that relates to what you were just saying about policies that the Israelis have taken that have in fact yeah. strengthened the internal leadership, and and the main one is the closure, which has yeah. led to the rise of this tunnel economy. I wrote a piece mm -hmm. about this for Salam yeah, back yeah. in early it February. I was in Gaza then, and I was just amazed at the extent of of mm -hmm. these of this industry. Um, no, it's given them to, financial uh, it, independence. Yeah. Right, and it, but but you talk about their, you know, who where their support is coming from. They, you know, they are taking, of course, they're taking the cream off the top of the millions that are being made off these tunnels. Right. Um, there is now a a firmly entrenched constituency lobby, if you will, uh, of these tunnel smugglers, these entrepreneurs sure. who have absolutely sure. no interest in a legalized border. Because that would right. hurt their, their, you know, that would hurt their income. That's this is on the Gaza and the Egypt side. And when yeah. I look at this, and when you consider the amount of work that uh, Israel did, you know, in the early 2000s to close down these tunnels, to bulldoze them, to mm -hmm. demolish them, to blow them yeah, up, yeah. on the on the very very understandable justification that they're bringing weapons through. Well, this has now yeah. completely expanded. They're obviously bringing yeah, weapons yeah. as well as soda through. But it whatever they bring, know, the, they bring cars through. They bring they bring cars exactly. They bring every, everything through. So that's so the question is listen. what what is the goal of the policy? And it seems yeah. fairly clear that the goal is to push Gaza into a closer relationship with with Egypt and thereby de detach it from the West Bank. Well, that's not going to happen because uh, Egyptians, I think, are united on mm. a few things, and one of them is at. Under all circumstances, I don't think I don't think any any Egyptian government, including a Muslim Brotherhood one, is going to want to let Israel off the mm -hmm. hook in Gaza by taking responsibility for Gaza again. Uh, Egypt can't afford Gaza mm -hmm. economically, diplomatically, politically, and I I mean I think where Spar goes most wrong is in his uh, opinion, which is is shared by the the the, the, the blogger who 
posted his uh, post, Barry Rubin, that Hamas is a big winner in the in the uh, Arab Spring uh, mm -hmm. because Sunni Islamists are in in uh, are well, they haven't taken power anywhere, but they are gaining an influence mm -hmm. in in countries like Egypt and uh, various other countries and across the board, and they're going to as political space opens up in the region, and and so. He says that uh, you know Hamas has been immeasurably strengthened by the advances made by Hamas's fellow Muslim Brotherhood branches in Egypt and elsewhere in the region. That's a direct quote. Now this is right. this is wrong. Okay, this is this is a misreading of the reality. If he put potential in that sentence, mm -hmm. or right. possible future, right. or something like that, okay, because it is possible that the changes would mm -hmm. greatly strengthen or immeasurably strengthen or simply strengthen Hamas's position. But in fact, they have not. They have right. damaged Hamas. Hamas is one of the major casualties of the Arab Spring because, and it's not just a question of the internal and external leadership, the fact that there's a crisis between the internal and external leadership of Hamas, which is the consequence of the uprisings, mm -hmm. and the regional realignment uh, mm -hmm. that has taken place, is not good for either the internal or external leaders. Um, I don't think it's not good for, for, the, for the organization as a, as a whole. It's, it's, it actually, this is an organization in, in significant crisis. The, it mm -hmm. certainly, the, and, and I think he also is wrong about the extent to which power has already shifted to the internal leaders. I mean, he, he makes a bunch of claims at the beginning of his uh, article that are speculative and, and mm -hmm. not based on uh, um, much. I mean, it's true that Michal is the head of the Politburo in Gaza. That doesn't surprise me one bit. That's nothing. That doesn't show any great shift mm -hmm. of power uh, to the, to the uh, Gaza leaders. The, the idea that the Gaza leaders now control the finances and the paramilitary is is uh, speculative reporting based on little information, and I I, I don't see any uh, empirical evidence of that, and I don't see any solid reporting uh, mm -hmm. that, that reflects that. Um, I mean, c clearly there is a power struggle going on here at multiple levels in in Hamas, and Hamas is in is an organization in a very large degree of crisis. And so to say that, that they are a beneficiary is wrong. They've lost their uh, their external headquarters uh, in Damascus, mm -hmm. their uh, foreign leadership, which is, you know, don't, Aspire doesn't recognize how important people like Mishal and Abu Marzouk and all these others are to that movement. Yeah. I mean, these are the remainders of the founders of that movement. These mm -hmm. are the people who were the associates of... Uh, Yassin and Rantisi and the others. I mean, these are these are founding fathers. They are not uh, to be simply cast aside. They they are very important symbolically, politically, and in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, they carry a cachet of authority. Uh, well, Zahar, Zahar has similar party. claims, doesn't he? Sorry, Mahmoud Zahar. Zahar. Uh, not 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 equivalent to. Mm. Um, no, not well, he does, of course, and and so does Hani. I mean, they have claims of, of having been around for a long time. They don't have equivalent claims of Abu Marzouk, for example, mm -hmm. or of Mishal. Uh, no, they they don't. Or a lot of people in the Politburo. I mean, that yeah. is, uh, and the other thing is the 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 the, uh, the Politburo is trying to do something that the Gaza leadership doesn't want to do, but that Hamas as an organization may really need to do in the right. long run, which is to reintegrate. Uh, Hamas into the Sunni Arab fold to get Hamas to adopt policies that look like the policies of, say, the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, which yeah. doesn't like Israel, but but isn't going to break Egypt's peace treaty with Israel and doesn't 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 not recognize Israel. Right. You see, if you see what I'm saying, it doesn't isn't interested in in a, in an open-ended war to um, uh, replace Israel with an Islamic state or anything right. like that. That that is. And, and to harmonize it even more importantly with the policies of the Arab League, which is the Arab Peace Initiative. So, I mean, in other words, if, if, Hamas, if Hamas' primary external patrons are going to be Qatar, Jordan, Turkey, Egypt, etc., even with the Muslim Brotherhood influenced government, it will not be controlled by the Muslim Brothers, but influenced yeah. government in Egypt, right. they are going to have to have very different policies than if their primary sponsors are Tehran and Damascus. 
And um, I, I think that the extern the internal leaders, the, the big difference between the external and the internal leaders is that the external leaders can't wait to see how much they could get out of um, I, 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 the, the, um, what they hope will be the continued ascendancy of Muslim Brotherhood parties mm -hmm. in, in states like Egypt, whereas the internal leaders can, can afford to wait. But yeah. neither of them can afford to be aloof. They right. need patrons. They need help. Yes, they have smuggling. Yes, they have. That gives them the breathing space to, well, to wait. But it doesn't give them the ability to sustain themselves independently. Mm -hmm. They need outside, all the Palestinians need outside support. They are a people who can't get by on their own, both um, uh, financially and uh, diplomatically and politically. So all the Palestinians need foreign allies and patrons, and that goes for Hamas as well as the PA, and it goes for the internal leadership of Hamas in Gaza in the long run as well. And uh, by the way, let me just say, I, I mean, I think there's no way they're not incredibly disappointed in the way their relationship with Egypt has evolved after the Muslim Brotherhood's mm -hmm. parliamentary victory, because it hasn't changed. It really, practically speaking, hasn't changed. Rafa, now there's twice as many people who go across the border. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that's, that's just people. And, and it's not a big, ch it's really not a big change. As far as e Egypt's security cooperation with Israel, that is as strong as ever, if not strong. I mean, there was a very big display of it recently uh, during some uh, unrest in Sinai. Uh, and, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, you, just, you see a lot of rhetoric from politicians who are running for office. Uh, Amr Musa gave a great quote the other day. He said, uh, the peace treaty with Israel is dead and buried, null and void. We have a peace treaty. We, uh, we respect it and we will enforce it as long as they do, but it's dead and buried. Now, <laughs> parse that, okay? Right. It's, it's like a, a Rorschach test. Whoever wants to read anything they want oh, to right. read. Right, I mean, this if gets you to wanna, something that I actually discuss. And I mean, they're all I, saying that kind of stuff. When I was there in, in February, I actually spoke to some Hamas officials, because, you know, they are, it seems that there is, I mean, I think Spire's piece gets to this, that there seems to be, you know, he's coming from the kind of conservative side, and there seems to be this weird unspoken bargain between is Islamists um, and and conservatives to, to play up the extent <laughs> to which the yeah. Arab Spring is going to boost Hamas, you know, and of course these Hamas leaders were telling, you know, me, this visiting American, how much the mm -hmm. Arab Spring was going to boost the power of Hamas, and soon all the Western governments would have to talk to Hamas, blah, 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 and it would well, help them in their efforts against Israel. Just look at Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood is on the rise there, and my question was, okay, sure, the Palestinian issue is, you know, this this rhetorical flag that people need to wave, mm -hmm. it's something yeah. that they're going to talk a lot about, but explain to me how this is going to help your situation, just practically describe right. that right. process, and they couldn't, of course, and I think we've seen of that course not. Yeah. very little. Yeah, no, of course. Well, in fact, it's a lot, and it's mostly negative. You see, mm -hmm. um, what what has happened? Is, it's a it's thrown them into a crisis. Uh, they haven't benefited from the changes in Egypt yet. They may, uh, but um, at the moment, no. And actually, mm -hmm. the spokesman of the Muslim Brothers in Egypt said something very interesting the other day. He said, "Listen, you know, when we were just a Muslim Brotherhood party, we could support Hamas without reservation. But now that we have a national role in Egypt, we mm -hmm. have to take Egypt's national interests into consideration, and we have to deal with both Palestinian factions yeah. equally, uh, which was, you know, and kind of totally unheard of rhetoric. Um, and you know, the the uh, party that the external leadership, especially Khalid Mishal, has been courting most, above all, is Qatar." And Qatar is the kind of grand regional patron of the Muslim Brotherhood parties in general. It is through the Muslim Brotherhood parties that Qatar seeks to project uh, regional power through money, basically, because that's all they have, really. Uh, but they have a lot of it, and, and their main uh, clients are the Muslim Brotherhood parties. And so when Mishal goes to Doha to get money and to reintegrate Hamas into the Sunni Arab fold, uh, post-Iran, post-Syria, mm -hmm. um, he, he, the price of it was to make an agreement with Mahmoud Abbas that was very much on the PLO and the PA's terms. It was very much on Abbas's terms. Mm -hmm. And there was outrage in Gaza that he would do this, not, not make an agreement with Abbas, that they all, they all want to do that. The question is on, has always been on whose terms. Mm -hmm. And on paper, the Doha agreement was very much on the PLO's terms, very, very much. 
And um, that's, that's why it was rejected and blocked and hasn't been enforced and whatnot. Uh, and indeed, you could say, well, the, this is square peg meeting round hole, and you can't really have an enforceable agreement between the two, even lubricated by Qatari money. Mm -hmm. But the point is that th all of this is symptomatic of an organization in profound crisis, not in ascendancy. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, it, it is a, a, a speculative leap that um, Hamas leaders make and uh, some observers, both on the left and the right, make when they say that the, the, the Arab Spring is opening political space and therefore there is room for Islamists to gain um, influence and gain a measure of power in countries like Egypt, which is true, and, and especially at the beginning, because they're established, they have a brand, they mm -hmm. have an oppositional record that they, they can run on uh, where um, uh, secularists and liberals and others uh, don't and, and uh, anyone associated with the old regimes, generally speaking, is tainted, mm -hmm. except perhaps the Egyptian Kissinger, um, <laughs> who seems to be doing a, a similar maneuver of, you know, I didn't know, I didn't do it, I was somewhere mm -hmm. else dealing mm -hmm. with the big, you know, national issues, I, mm -hmm. I held something, it sounded idiotic, you know, that kind of thing. Um, you know, but, but other than that, uh, the field is sort of open to them, even in countries with secular majorities. I mean, Tunisia had, uh, you know, about 40% vote for Nahda. Uh, it means that the secular parties got way over 50%, but there are 21 of them, literally 21. And there's one big Islamist party, so they became the biggest party. Mm -hmm. you know, they're not a majority, but they're the biggest party. So, and my point is that none of this is translated into huge gains for, or any palpable gains for Hamas whatsoever, mm -hmm. and, and particularly not in Egypt where, as I said, the, the, the relationship, physical relationship between Egypt and Gaza hasn't changed, and the security relationship between Egypt and Israel hasn't changed, so you look for improvements from Hamas's point of view in vain. On the other hand, uh, look at what's happened with their relationship with Syria, and which is destroyed, and their relationship with Iran, which is hanging by a thread and is only exists with, with the leaders in Gaza. It, it doesn't exist at all, I think, with the external I mean, leaders. I would argue uh, that... And, that and that's an organization in crisis, massive crisis. I mean, I agree with a lot of what you said, and I, I think we have to bring this to a close pretty quickly here, but I just... Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I agree with a lot of what you said about the, uh, the crisis. Yes, they've lost their home. They, their leadership is sort of scattered. But I think there is some mm -hmm. value. I mean, it's hard to really, to, to, to really gauge it. But there is some value, I think, to you know, being seen standing up there with the Egyptians, negotiating with Fatah. Um, yeah. You know, just in terms of profile, in terms of being, yes, if we they, are here. If they can reintegrate. So, I mean, if I they can successfully, let, let me just say, you're, you're right, if they could successfully reintegrate into the Sunni Arab mm -hmm. order with mm -hmm. go, based on good relations with as three, these three points, with Qatar, Jordan, and Egypt, and, and, and rebrand themselves, because they have a brand crisis, yeah. branding crisis, they have an identity crisis, if they could rebrand themselves as the Palestinian version of the Muslim Brotherhood, whose policies are in line with the rest of the Muslim <laughs> Brothers in the region, which is very different than, than the, the Hamas attitude towards Israel, and, uh, and, and in line with the Arab states, in line mm -hmm. with Qatar's approach to, to Israel, which is downright friendly, mm -hmm. and with Jordan's, which is friendly, and with Egypt's, which is um, dedicated to maintaining the peace, including the Muslim Brothers, so mm -hmm. as far as we can tell. Um, so if they, would, you know, if they can do that, if they can align themselves with the Sunni Arab mainstream, uh, then they, they can, uh, I think, uh, benefit a lot. The mm. problem with that is that all of those positions are really reflective of the positions of the PLO. So there's the big challenge for them is this is this would be to sacrifice uh, their main competitive advantage politically over the PLO, which is that they're more strident on Israel matters than the PLO is. Mm. If they if they did that. They would come very close to accepting the quartet conditions. They'd come mm -hmm. very. They'd have to come very close to accepting the goal of a two-state solution, and they'd start to sound a lot like the most strident people in Fatah and the PLO, and not like Hamas. And and this, you know, I, 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 this new brand, I think it, w it would, if it went forward, it would actually m potentially really allow, it would make the square peg more round, round enough maybe to uh, accommodate a reconciliation, a real reconciliation, because they might disagree on uh, little enough that they could actually do some kind of national re reunification, but it would mean 
the victory of uh, certain factions in Hamas over over others, and it would mean a new Hamas. It really would. Mm -hmm. And I think there are a lot. That, as I've been saying since, like you guess, November or something, that Hamas is changing. But but their the goal. Uh, uh, it, both internal and external is to, is to keep the price as low as possible precisely because w the price they have to pay has to do with their competitive political advantage vis-a-vis -vis the PLO in domestic Palestinian politics on matters of Israel. It, it, the price has to be to be less anti-status quo, less less aggressive towards Israel, less less of the violent rhetoric and all of that stuff, and, and closer to where the rest of the Arabs and where the Arab Muslim brothers and the Qataris and whatnot are vis-a-vis -vis Israel. They've been very, very far from that in the past. If they move in that direction, a lot of their supporters are going to uh, have to um, re re you know, reconceptualize the world. Okay, that's a, a good place to, to stop. Thanks so much, Hussein, for taking some time today. Great. Uh, viewers, you, you, can, you can follow Hussein on Twitter, as you should, at Ibish Blog. Um, and me at Matt Duss, um, and you can join our Facebook page for an entanglements. Uh, mm -hmm. So we'll see you next time. Thanks, Hussein. Thanks much. Bye bye.